Hello and welcome to Let's Talk, a series of podcasts produced by the Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation on substance use issues, issues that matter to us as an organization and issues we know that matter to you too. Issues related to prevention, research, addiction, treatment, and recovery from a substance use disorder. I'm your host, William Moyers, and today our topic is addiction recovery and support for families. I can't think of two better colleagues who are experts when it comes to addiction recovery in the family than my two who are joining me today, Sarah Schwambach and Julia Edelman. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. You are both therapists. Is that the right way to describe it at the uh, Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation Center for Youth mm -hmm. in suburban Minneapolis and Plymouth, Minnesota, you right? And we both work in the family program in particular. Yeah. Okay, and to tell us just a little bit, that family program is for family members. Why family members? Because mm -hmm. there's a family recovery process. Mm -hmm. So it's a three and a half day program that we offer to the family members of our clients who come through uh, residential programs with us. It's also open to the public too. Um, and we, we do a lot of education. We mm -hmm. uh, do a lot of processing. Uh, we help families uh, navigate this, this journey. So it's addiction that brings people to the facility, but it's your goal is to help them begin their own recovery process. Yes, each why and every is that, person. Why is that important, recovery in the family? Whether or not the uh, addict in the family recovers, the family must recover, right? We don't know if the addict is gonna recover. Hopefully they will, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But regardless, each person in the family needs to reclaim their own life and they need to not go down with the ship if the ship is gonna go down. And so uh, a lot of our work is around helping families redefine what their family is, who they are, who they wanna be, what's been lost and how they can move forward. So let's focus on a couple of things as it relates to that. One of them being trust, yes. mm -hmm. another one being boundaries, relapse, and then we're gonna end up talking about resources that are available for family members. Sarah, t talk to, to us about the toll that addiction takes on trust and how that trust is rebuilt. Yeah, there's a big toll that's taken on trust in, in families and in family relationships when addiction enters the picture. Um, it can, that trust is, is broken in, in a variety of ways, sure. and so it needs to be rebuilt in a number of ways. Um, how do you do it? Yeah. Through a few different ways come to mind. Um, boundaries, having clear, healthy, mm -hmm. effective boundaries in mm -hmm. place, following through with those boundaries with, with a loved one. Um, you know, we talk a lot about actions aligning uh, with words. And when, when somebody's actions are aligning with their words, that's how trust is rebuilt, right? So we don't want to just give trust back unearned. Um, it's something that needs to be, be rebuilt. Um, something too that I, I talk with families about quite a bit is thinking about, you know, it's, it's really easy for families to say, we have to have these boundaries in place because we don't trust you. Mm -hmm. Trying to reframe that to, I want to build back trust with you. This is how we're gonna do it. These are the boundaries that are in place. These are what the expectations are. And this is how we're gonna be able to rebuild some trust. Like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I ask families to look at this as though you're looking at a computer screen and we're just gonna, uh, if your computer screen looks like anything like mine, it's filled with a bunch of icons, mm -hmm. right? We're gonna wipe all those icons off of the computer screen. We're gonna start fresh mm -hmm. and we're just gonna put on the icons that matter the most to our family. So honesty, um, maybe family fun time, right? So we're just gonna put on a few icons. We're gonna start small so um, we have better chances for success, right? And, um, and then we can build from there. Mm -hmm. What, um, but how does it, but parents are used to being parents, right? We're, when we're parents, we, we, we tend to be in our child's business because for all the right reasons. But, but when you talk about boundaries, how do you set a boundary if you're a parent and still be the parent you wanna be? Mm -hmm. So there's this phrase detaching with love that yes. we often use, yes. right? And what does that mean is always the, the big question that we get. So we're always parents. We'll be parents when we're 
80 years old, 90 years old, right? How we parent is different and how we parent someone in active addiction is different than how we parent someone in early recovery is different from how we um, parent our kids when they have kids. So it's very situational. A lot of our work is situational. We try to look at each family and help guide each family along. It's gonna be different for each, in each case. Mm -hmm. um, with parents, too, we often talk about um, how there's um, they're powerless over the addiction, right? Mm -hmm. Now, even though you're powerless over the addiction, that doesn't mean that you're without influence. And so how do you leverage that influence mm -hmm. um, to have the outcome that, mm -hmm. that you're hoping for? And talk about recovery in the family when the addict or the alcoholic in the family is not necessarily recovering. That's important, right? Moms and dads and siblings, we haven't talked about siblings, but moms and dads and sisters and brothers, they need to take care of themselves no matter what, right? Right, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, so understanding, sometimes siblings get lost in um, helping to cover up mm -hmm. their brother's or sister's addiction, right? So when they come to the family program, we talk, we give them a, a forum to talk about that and um, ask, they can ask themselves, is this helping me? Is this hurting me? Usually it's hurting, right? So we give them an opportunity to talk about that. Comes back to boundaries too, or maybe mm -hmm. plays into the boundaries topic. Uh, family members having healthy boundaries for themselves, mm -hmm. uh, modeling that behavior for their loved one is actually what's going to be most helpful. And nobody masters this overnight or even in the four or five days that they're in the family and parent and sibling program, right? No. Right. Recovery is a lifelong process, as right. we often say. And so each day at a time in early recovery, it's each hour at a time. Um, same holds true for family members. Mm -hmm. And family members, as an addict, might get triggered by driving by a liquor store one day. A parent may be triggered by their son or daughter not being home at curfew, mm -hmm. right? So they have choices. They can get in their car and they can start doing maybe their old behavior of driving around to all the friends' houses or the, the various venues to see if their son or daughter is there. Or they could call a sponsor from Al-Anon, for example, mm -hmm. or talk to their spouse or a good friend. Then take the opportunity to talk to their son or their daughter the next day. Mm -hmm. Just, we have to do things differently. Mm -hmm. Of course, we do know though, that with the chronic illness of substance use disorder, that means chronic, means it can come back. I and mean, yeah. there are ex ex lots of experiences of relapse, or as we like to say, a recurrence of use. Mm -hmm. How does the recurrence of use the relapse factor into the boundaries that a parent might have. Does that mean that the parent just turns away and says, well, you're on your own, good luck, and don't come home or whatever? How, how does the family deal with that? It's going to vary from family to family. Um, each family has had a different journey, a different path to get them to the point that they're at now. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the family has to do what, what they're comfortable with, all is not lost if a relapse uh, were to happen or a recurrence were to happen. Families can often come out the other side much stronger uh, than they were before, and the same for the addict alcoholic. It can be a really a, a big learning experience. Yeah, yeah. and uh, as we, uh, we talk about a prevention plan for families, there's always a prevention plan for the clients and for the patients before they leave Hazelden Betty Ford. We also give the families an opportunity to have a prevention plan and they talk about it with their loved one that's in treatment. They talk as um, spouses or partners with one another about what that prevention plan is gonna be. And it does go back once again to um, looking at values, setting boundaries, following through. Mm -hmm. But uh, we really talk about if you're having these feelings come up, if you're finding yourself with an urge to drive around the town at two o'clock in the morning looking for your son or daughter, what do you do, mm -hmm. right? I wanna talk about resources in just a moment, but I wanna end on a, on a positive note there. And before we get there, I wanna talk just a little bit about a reality that we have dis become more keenly aware of in the opioid epidemic, which is that sadly, when there's a recurrence of use or when people relapse, um, oftentimes that can lead to overdose and that can lead to death. Mm -hmm. It happens. 
and, and, and it's a reality of the illness, but that doesn't mean that the family can't recover, right? right. Absolutely. So what's your, what's your message to those families who might be tuning in today who've lost their son or their daughter or their sister or brother or their grandchild to this illness as it relates to their own recoveries? What's the message? That there's hope and that they can, that they can still choose recovery for themselves. Yeah. We do talk about the, the process of grief. Yeah. Uh, regardless if, if there's been a loss in the family, we really look at a grieving process that we all go through. Um, Elizabeth Kuva Ross's uh, stages of grief, we do use that model because we have denial and we have bargaining and we have depression. And hopefully we come through these stages of grief and we come into a place of acceptance. And I have seen even families that have lost a loved one to this insidious disease come to that place of acceptance and still hope. Right, and that acceptance doesn't mean that um, you ever forget or, or aren't impacted by the loss of a loved one. Um, you come to a different place with it though. You're, you're able to live. And, able to live. Yeah. And somehow, oddly stronger families. And then we practice step 12, helping other people, helping yes. other families, helping other people that are still suffering. Let's talk about the resources that are available to families um, who may have a loved one in active addiction or families who are, as we, the focus today is on recovery. What are those resources that are available to them? We've talked a little bit about Al-Anon, mm -hmm. Families Anonymous. Mm -hmm. What else? Uh, whatever the family needs to do so that they can be taken care of themselves. Maybe that looks like individual therapy. Maybe it looks like marriage, couple, family therapy. Um, maybe it means getting connected with an AA, an AA group for themselves, mm -hmm. um, getting reconnected with an AA group. Maybe it means getting connected with an Al-Anon group, getting reconnected with an Al-Anon group. Yeah. Um, if they're local, there are lots of resources here in the Twin Cities. Yeah. I had the most beautiful experience a few months ago. There was a teenager who was recognizing a lack of resources for herself. So she started an Alateen mm -hmm. meeting um, in the neighborhood. I just mm. thought, wow, that mm -hmm. takes a lot of uh, and, yeah, 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 it yeah. was really, really cool. So there's also a lot of online resources. Okay. Um, uh, personally, I'm a big believer, and this was my path, I'm a big believer mm -hmm. in walking into a meeting and being able to sit down and look at someone in the eye and say, I need help, uh, mm -hmm. or I'm struggling. And uh, so I really believe in the face-to-face -face and building an, a, a real live community, but mm -hmm. a lot of people do benefit from online communities. We all also know, I'll say, that um, there's a lot of isolation that happens with this disease, yes. right? So again, I'm making a case for just doing it in real time and getting, getting to a meeting, whether it is you know, for the parents or for the addict. But getting to a meeting and as a fallback, there is online community. Right. Mm -hmm. I agree with Julia that in-person um, is probably what we would recommend, in-person Al-Anon meetings, mm -hmm. those sorts of things. However, there is a time and a place and a space to augment with some online uh, support, uh, support mm -hmm. including the Daily Pledge. That's a really good mm -hmm. one that we have through the mm -hmm. Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation. Yes. There are... Um, online Al-Anon meetings, AA meetings. Um, there's a Caring Families group mm -hmm. every Tuesday online, Tuesday evening. So getting involved with some of those resources, knowing that you're not alone. Right. Uh, yeah. And then, of course, there's personal resources. Mm -hmm. So, gosh, I used to do yoga three times a week, yeah. and I haven't done it in, I haven't done a sun salutation in a year. So getting back to some of the things that really gave us some joy and health journaling, a gratitude, yep. yes. mindful, a mindfulness practice. Absolutely. Um, and what about, just before we close, because we're almost out of time, but what about um, parents who go to the, their, their sons or their daughters' recovery meeting or, 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 or sons and daughters that go to their parents' recovery meeting? Is, that's mm -hmm. okay, right? It, or not? It is. I believe that it is absolutely okay but talk first, check it out first. There was, we had a young man who was uh, in treatment for heroin and a dad came through the family program a number of years ago. He also was in recovery from heroin. Thought it was the most beautiful thing. 
dad said, hey, would I be would I be stamping on your toes if I went to a meeting with you? What do you think about that? So they talked about it. They had some solidarity. They did go to a meeting together, but check it out first. Mm -hmm. um, same thing about um, sponsorship. Yeah. Sometimes it's like, oh yeah, Uncle Bob, he's been in recovery for 20 <laughs> years. He'd be a great sponsor for you. Mm, maybe not. Proceed with caution. Because um, that's, that's Johnny's recovery process. That's yeah. part of his process to find his yes. sponsor. Yes. Um, and so we don't want to take that right. opportunity away from him. Right. And this is mm -hmm. a program of attraction, right? Mm -hmm. So let Johnny find somebody who really he connects with. Right. Maybe it's not Uncle Bob. Maybe it is, but eh. <laughs> Well, Julia Edelman and Sarah Schwalbach, thank you very much for bringing your experience, strength, and hope, your professional expertise, and that personal passion that I can tell both of you have to our topic for today, addiction recovery and support for families. Thank you for all you're doing to help people to recover. Thanks for having us. Thank you're you, welcome. William. On behalf of all my colleagues at the Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation, I'm your host, William Moyers, and we thank you for another edition of Let's Talk, this series of podcasts on the issues that really speak to the essence of recovery from a substance use disorder. I think the key message from all of these podcasts is that there is hope, and we hope that you will hold on to that hope at least until our next podcast. So please join us again for Let's Talk. Thank you.